We're delighted tonight to have an excellent gospel preacher to present the lesson that we're about to hear. Brother Ken Hope was born up in Flint, Michigan, but he made it bound to Texas about as quickly as he could and graduated from North uh, Mesquite High School and then graduated also from college at Oklahoma Christian College in 1977. He married Julie Ramsey, who's with us tonight. Julie is the daughter of uh, Johnny and Iris Ramsey, and all of us know and love the Ramsey family so very much. And Julie, it's good that you came with Ken tonight, and you remind me so much of your father. A uh, wonderful, wonderful gospel preacher he was, and a very, very dear friend. Uh, Ken uh, started his preaching in Fruitvale, Texas, where Carl McCann presently preaches. And uh, he was there from 1981 through 83, and he's been with the Centerville Road Congregation in Garland uh, since 1983. And he's had endeared himself to all of us who know and love him and who have heard him preach time and again. He also serves as one of the elders there at the Centerville Congregation, and he is a part-time instructor at the Brown Trail School of Preaching and so he has many uh, intertwinings with us here, and we appreciate him so much. He has conducted marriage and parenting seminars. He preaches in gospel meet meetings and participates in various brotherhood lectureships. And he's going to be speaking to us tonight on the subject of avoiding the works of the flesh. He did tell me a moment ago that he's having some throat problems. He said he hoped he could make it through, but we'll have to wait and see. He's got him a little bottle of water up here and a cough drop, so maybe he'll do that. Ken, we love you. We're looking forward to hearing you. Well, if I might change the adage of what you see is what you get, but what you hear is what you get. Because this is about all the volume I have tonight, but... Let me state this, I am delighted to be with you tonight. I am certainly honored to have a part on this wonderful lectureship. I am extremely thankful to be able to call Maxi Boren my friend and my brother in Christ. He means so very much to me and our family. And likewise, I hope I'm speaking for everyone tonight when I say that it's a joy for all of us to be here with those of like precious faith, for us to open up God's word and to study challenging lessons like the one before us, avoiding the works of the flesh. Now, as we begin this evening, I want you to know that I have good news and I have bad news. Now, really, I guess the best story I've ever heard relative to good news or bad news was about a husband and a wife. And the wife knew that her husband was sick, but she couldn't convince him to go to the doctor. Finally, she did. She coaxed him, she coerced him, got him to the doctor, and as they're in the examining room, the doctor looked at the wife and sort of motioned her to go out in the hallway. In a moment, the doctor met her in the hallway. And he said, I have good news and I have bad news. And she said, well, doctor, what's the bad news? And the doctor said, you're exactly right. Your husband is sick. He is extremely sick. She said, what's the good news? And he said, well, he's going to be okay. He's going to make it if you'll do what I tell you. He said, first, he's going to need his strength. So you're going to need to make him three nutritious, delicious meals every day. Secondly, he's going to need a stress-free environment. So absolutely no quarreling, no fighting, no complaining. And third, he's going to need encouragement and motivation to get better. So you're going to have to be the kindest wife, the sweetest wife, the most loving wife that anyone has ever seen. And he said, now, do you understand what I'm saying? She said, absolutely. So they're driving home, and the husband turned to his wife, and he said, honey, what did the doctor say to you when you were in the hallway? She looked at him, and she said, well, I guess I can tell you. He said, you're not going to make it. 
Good news and bad news. I have both tonight about avoiding the works of the flesh. The bad news is, and I think we'll all agree with this, the bad news is there's a sense in which we cannot avoid these works, these deeds of the flesh. They are everywhere around us. It seems that everywhere we look, wherever we turn, we see these works of the flesh. Remember what God told Cain in Genesis 4 and verse 7? Sin is crouching at the door. Its desire is for you and you must master it. And so we realize sin, these works of the flesh, they're crouching at the door. We have those today in our nation who parade these sins and sins like them down Main Street. We have those who have become instant heroes because they have proclaimed their deviant lifestyle. They have admitted that they commit abominations to God and man, and all of a sudden society embraces them. And so there's a sense in which we cannot avoid the works of the flesh. You remember Jeremiah 6 and verse 15? Were they ashamed because of all their abominations? No, they were not ashamed. They didn't even know how to blush. You know, later on in that great book, in chapter 11 and verse 15, it adds something even more startling. It says, when they do evil, then they rejoice. And so it's like in Zephaniah 3 and verse 5. The unjust knows no shame. Isaiah 3 and verse 9. They display their sin like Sodom. They do not even conceal it. And so there's a sense in which we ought to understand that as we seek and strive with all of our being to avoid the works of the flesh, we're not going to be able to. You remember in Revelation 2 and verse 13, God speaks, the Lord there, Jesus, he speaks to the church at Pergamos. And remember in that context, he says, I know where you dwell. And then he says two interesting things in that verse. Where Satan's throne is. Where Satan dwells. So he says, I know where you dwell. I know how difficult it is where you live. And again, it's true even today. Yes, we're citizens of heaven. But our residency is performed out here on this earth. And so God says, I know where you live. I know where you dwell, where Satan does. 1 John 5 and verse 19. The whole world lies in the power of the evil one. So as we think about avoiding the works of the flesh, there's a sense in which we can't. Our society is inundated with these sins, with these transgressions. Turn on the television. Turn on the radio. Go to the internet. Pick up the paper look through any almost magazine, and you'll see that the works, the sins of the flesh, they rule in our society. Remember 1 John 2, verses 15 and following? Again, in that context, it talks about the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the vain glory of life. Well, that's what people want to see today. That's what people want to hear. But now here's the good news. There's also a sense in which we can and we must avoid the works of the flesh. Now, as we've just mentioned, yes, we're going to be exposed to them, but we do not have to participate in them. Remember Proverbs 1 and verse 10? My son, if sinners entice you, do not consent. It's times on occasions like this that we need to be challenged to rise up and live the life that our Lord has called us to live. Ephesians 4 and verse 1, we're to walk in a manner worthy of the gospel, our calling. In Colossians 1 and verse 10, we're to walk in a manner worthy of the Lord. And in 1 Thessalonians 2 and verse 12, we're to walk in a manner worthy of God. And it certainly is time for every one of us to do just that. You remember in 1 Peter 2 and verse 11, Peter says, I urge you as strangers and aliens to abstain from fleshly lusts which wage war against the soul. 
Later on in that same book, 1 Peter 4 and verse 2, he tells them that they should spend the rest of their time not for the lust of men, but for the will of God. And so, yes, there's a sense in which, by way of exposure, we cannot avoid the works of the flesh. But regarding participation, by all means, we must avoid. And we shall, if we'll live the kind of life that our Lord has called us to live. You remember 2 Timothy 2 and verse 19? The firm foundation of God stands sure, having this seal. The Lord knows those who are his. And let everyone who names the name of Christ depart from iniquity. You know, our problem in our society, I'm not talking so much about the church right now. But in our society, our problem is that we want to engage in the works of the flesh. But then we want to reap the fruit of the Spirit. And it doesn't work like that, does it? The Bible teaches in Galatians 6, verses 7 and 8, Do not be deceived. God is not mocked. For whatever a man sows, that shall he also reap. If he sows the flesh, he shall of the flesh reap corruption. But if he sows the Spirit, he shall of the Spirit reap eternal life. I was preaching a gospel meeting in Sarah, Oklahoma. And on Sunday night, they asked me if I would speak to the young people. They were having a devotional. And so I thought, yeah, what, what will I do? And I thought, I'll take them to the book of 1 Peter. So we went to the book of 1 Peter, and I challenged them as we went into that book. I said, now, I want everyone to listen. I want you to listen so intently that you can repeat the simple points that we're about to look at. So that got their attention. They were listening. So we went to chapter 1 and verse 9, having as the outcome of our faith the salvation of our soul. And I said, the simple point from chapter 1 is we have a soul to save. We went to chapter 2 and verse 21, that Jesus Christ, he is our example to follow in his footsteps. I said, not only do we have a soul to save, but we have a Savior to imitate. We went to chapter 3 and verse 15, sanctify Christ as Lord in your heart. Be ready always to give an answer to every man who asks you the reason of the hope that is within you, with meekness and with fear. So not only we have a soul to save and a Savior to imitate, but we have a message to share. 1 Peter 4 and verse 11. Glorify God in all things. We have a God to glorify. And of course, 1 Peter 5, verses 8 and 9. Be sober, be vigilant. For your adversary the devil prowls about like a roaring lion, seeking whom he may devour, but resist him firm in your faith. And so added to that list, a soul to save, a savior to imitate, a message to share, a God to glorify, we have an adversary to resist. And so I said, did anyone listen good enough to repeat that list? One young man raised his hand. He said, I did. And I said, well, let's hear it. He said, 1 Peter 1 and verse 9, we have a soul to save. 1 Peter 2 and verse 21, we have a Savior to imitate. 1 Peter 3 and verse 15, we have a message to share. 1 Peter 4 and verse 11, we have a God to glorify. Well, you know, about this time, I'm thinking, wow, this young man is pretty sharp. And then I'm also thinking, or maybe, maybe I've just done a great, great job. Well, then, of course, what always happens, pride goes before destruction, a haughty spirit before a fall. He gets to the last point, and he says, 1 Peter 5, verses 8 and 9, we have an adversary to assist. <laughs> I said, time out. Time out. I didn't say that. Strike the record, you know. But I fear that that's what happens many times if we're not careful in our lives. We're assisting the adversary instead of resisting. We want to live the life of sin and yet be known as a saint. The story was told about two brothers. These brothers were notorious in their little community. These were older men and they have wreaked havoc. These men were vile, they were wretched, they were miserable. 
They were worthless, they were scoundrels, they were thieves, they were immoral, they were ungodly. You name it, they were. Well, one of them died. And the remaining brother went to the local preacher, a man who was known to tell it like it was. And he said, preacher, I'll give you $1,000 if you'll do my brother's funeral. He said, the only stipulation is you have to say he was a saint. Well, the preacher accepted immediately. The community couldn't believe it. The story, you know how it circulates. So everyone was there for the funeral. They wanted to know what has gone on with this preacher. He's usually a straight, a straight shooter. So the preacher gets up that day and he says, we all know this man. He went on to say he's worthless. He was immoral. He was ungodly. He was wretched. He was wicked. But he paused and he said, but next to his brother, he was a saint. <laughs> well, again, it reinforces what we're saying. We want, we think at times, we want to think that we can live the life of a sinner and yet at the end be called a saint. We can engage in those works of the flesh and reap in our lives the fruit of the Spirit. But of course, that's certainly not how it works. Numbers 23 and verse 10, the wicked prophet Balaam, let me die the death of the upright and let my end be like his. Well, that's a wonderful sentiment, but before it can become a reality, we have to live the life of the upright. Our death will not be like theirs unless our lives also was like theirs. But tonight, for just a moment, here's what I want us to do regarding this topic, avoiding the works of the flesh. Let's ask and answer three questions. The first question, what are they? What are the works of the flesh? The second question, why should I? Why should I avoid the works of the flesh? And the third question, how can I? How can I avoid the works of the flesh? So remember those three questions summed up in nine words. What are they? Why should I? How can I? Let's go to Galatians 5. In Galatians, the fifth chapter, notice, if you will, with me, verses 19 through 21. Here Paul is going to enumerate by inspiration what he has titled the works of the flesh, the deeds of the flesh. And remember, this is not a comprehensive list. He's going to add and such like or and like in other translations. I'm going to be reading from the New King James. In the New King James, you'll find 17 works of the flesh. And make a note of this mentally. The first four, the first four are sexual sins. The next two are religious sins or sins of idolatry. The following nine, they are social sins or social transgressions. And then the last two, they are personal sins or sins of intemperance. Now read this list with me. Notice what it says, Galatians 5 and verse 19. Now the works of the flesh are evident, which are adultery, fornication, uncleanness, lewdness, idolatry, sorcery, hatred, contentions, jealousies, outbursts of wrath, selfish ambitions, dissensions, heresies, envy, murders, drunkenness, revelries, and the like, of which I tell you beforehand, just as I also told you in time past, that those who practice such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. Now, brethren, there's so much that I'm not going to be able to deal with in this study. In the book, we have little descriptions of each one of these let it suffice tonight simply to say what Paul says. The works of the flesh, these are evident. 
We know what these are. We have seen these. Remember what we said earlier? There's a sense in which we cannot avoid these because our world is practicing these. Our world is engaged in these things. But we can know because God has revealed what they are. Remember in Micah 6 and verse 8, Micah says, He has shown you, O man, what is good. And what does the Lord require of you but to do justice, to love mercy, and to walk humbly with your God? Now, we usually emphasize those last three things, but notice the first of it again. He has shown you, O man, what is good. And even in this situation, God has shown us. He's shown us the works of the flesh. He has told us what they are. He has taught us about these. Remember in 1 Thessalonians 4 and verse 9, Paul tells his brethren about the love of the brethren. I have no need to write. And he goes on to say why. Because God himself has taught you to love the brethren. So God has shown us the works of the flesh. He has told us. He's taught us. Like Romans 1 and verse 20, we are without excuse. You remember in Hosea 4 and verse 6, my people are destroyed for lack of knowledge. Well, we shouldn't be because we know what they are. What are the works of the flesh? Galatians 5 verses 19 through 21 walk us through them. And again, it is not an exhaustive list. It wasn't intended to be. Lest we form some checklist mentality and say, well, okay, I don't do this, I don't do that. But remember, these are general. These are sexual sins. These are religious sins. These are social sins. They are personal sins. And there's more than just listed here. So what are they? Well, the next question, why should we? Why should I avoid the works of the flesh? You know, when we ask that question, I want to point one thing out in the book. I made the reference to Job 40 and verse 8. When we ask the question, why should I? You know, it would make as much sense to say, why should I avoid petting the Leviathan? Go back to Job. You remember in that verse, chapter 40 and verse 8, listen to it. Job is speaking by inspiration about the Leviathan, that great creature that man cannot tame, let alone create. It inspires us with awe when we think about every question that God asked Job, beginning in Job 38. But again, in Job 40 and verse 8, the Bible concerning the Leviathan, it says, lay your hand on him. Remember the battle. Never do it again. No, we wouldn't, would we? It's like that hot stove. You touch it. You don't have to keep touching it to realize it's hot. You avoid it. And so why should I? Well, ultimately, it boils down to one thing because we have been taught to. We have been told to. You remember in Matthew 8 and verse 9, the centurion said, I too am a man of authority. I say to this one, go and he goes. I say to this one, come and he comes. I say to this one, do it and he does it. Well, that's the kind of respect we all need to have for our Lord and his teaching. Ultimately, he has told us to avoid the works of the flesh. But let's do this. You can see in your book, we've listed 10 reasons and we've lifted these reasons from the verses assigned, Galatians 5, verses 16 through 21, also verse 24, and also chapter 6, verses 7 and 8. Let me just read through these. This, by staying in Galatians alone, tells us why. Why we should, why we must avoid the works of the flesh. In Galatians 5 and verse 16, Notice this, the first reason, because we walk in the Spirit. There's the reason, we walk in the Spirit. There's nothing mystical or magical about that. Paul is going to be talking about walking in the Spirit, 
being led by the Spirit, living in the Spirit. Well, all that is teaching us is that when I hear the Spirit's instructions, when I listen to His teaching, and I am obedient thereunto, then I am walking by the Spirit. I'm led by the Spirit. I'm living in the Spirit. And so there's the first reason. Why? Well, once again, because of Galatians 5 and verse 16, because we walk in the Spirit. Second reason, still in verse 16 of Galatians 5, because in so walking we will not fulfill the works of the flesh. You see, Paul's point here is that these two are at enmity with one another. They are the antithesis of each other, the flesh and the spirit. And so if we're walking by the spirit, we're not going to engage in the works of the flesh. A third reason why, Galatians 5 and verse 17, because the flesh and the spirit are contrary to one another. And a fourth point, still from verse 17, now listen to this carefully, because you cannot do the things that you wish. Some translations say you cannot do what you would. And I think at times we overlook this basic fundamental principle. Why can't I engage in the works of the flesh? And it's because those passions that want to conquer me, the desires, the passions, the lust of the flesh. Since I became a Christian, since I counted the cost, and since I told my Lord I'm willing to pay the price, since I have been determined to do that, dedicated to his cause, sanctified, the simple reality is I cannot now do simply what I want to do. I cannot do what I would you remember Luke 9 and verse 23? Jesus said, if any man wishes to come after me, let him deny himself. Take up his cross daily and follow me. Notice that, deny self. We can't do any longer simply what we want to do. We're Christians. We're children of the king. He's called us to live on a higher plane. Well, look at number five. Because those who practice such things shall not inherit the kingdom of God. Galatians 5 and verse 21. Now you know similar language is used in 1 Corinthians 6 verses 9 through 11. Same thing two times. Those who practice these things shall not inherit the kingdom of God. That's how serious what we're talking about is. Do we really want to be a child of God? Do we really want to live faithful to death? Do we really want to hear those words, well done, thou good and faithful servant? Well, look at number six. In Galatians 5, again in verse 21, the Bible teaches that because both God and man have laws against such things. Isn't it interesting when at the end of the list of the fruit of the Spirit, against such there is no law. Concerning the fruit of the Spirit, neither God nor man has enacted laws against those things. That's how wholesome, that's how good and right they are. But regarding these, the implication is, yes, God and man claims that these are unlawful. Well, look at number seven. Because you are Christ and belong to him. Galatians 5 and verse 24, notice what it says. In Galatians 5 and verse 24, And those who are Christ have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. Other translations say those who belong to Christ. Those who are Christ, those who belong to Christ. That's one of the reasons why, why we should avoid the works of the flesh. Because we belong to Christ Jesus. We have been bought with a price, haven't we? 1 Corinthians 6, verses 19 and 20. Well, point number nine. Point number nine, because 
In Galatians 6, verse 7, God is not mocked. We cannot, as we've already mentioned, just simply do what we want to do and mock God and his teaching and think that we're going to be left alone. God's promised to punish sin. I don't care who it is who sins. They're going to be punished. Reading Hebrews, the second chapter, verses 2 and 3, every sin, every disobedience received a just recompense. How shall we escape if we neglect so great salvation? The point by the Hebrew writer is simple. God has promised to punish sin. He has punished every sin. Now, how do we think we're going to be the first ones to escape? We're not. And that's the point here. God is not mocked. Again, you remember in Ecclesiastes 8 and verse 11. In that context, Solomon says, Since the sentence of an evil deed is not executed quickly, therefore the hearts of the sons of men are given fully to do evil. We foolishly at times think that we put one over on God. He's promised to punish sin. I just sinned, and he didn't punish me. Well, that's the point there. Since the sentence of an evil deed is not executed quickly, since God doesn't punish us immediately at times when we sin, we think we've gotten away with it, when in reality we have not. God ultimately is not going to be mocked. And look at number 10. Because you reap what you sow. That's why we should avoid the works of the flesh. You reap what you sow. If you sow to the flesh, you shall of the flesh reap corruption. But if you sow to the Spirit, you shall of the Spirit reap eternal life. Again, Galatians 6, verses 7 and 8. And so we looked at the question, what are they? Well, Galatians 5, verses 19 through 21 answers that. We looked at the question, why should I? Why should I avoid the works of the flesh? And again, just a cursory look through Galatians, the fifth chapter, part of the sixth chapter, supplies us with many reasons regarding why. And now the last question, how can I? How can I avoid the works of the flesh. You see, there's a sense in which our first question, it dealt with knowledge and facts. What are they? The second question dealt with our motivation. Why should I? And now this question is really going to be zeroing in on our resolve. We need to make a resolve that we're not going to follow the works of the flesh. We're going to avoid those. Our lives are not going to be spent pursuing those sins. We are going to occupy our time in developing and cultivating the fruit of the Spirit. But look at this now. This last question, how can we? And remember, we didn't ask the question, can we? It's a given that we can. This is a lot like Psalm 119 and verse 9. Remember in that context, how can a young man keep his way pure? That question does not ask, can a young man keep his way pure? He can. The question is how? Tonight, we're not asking, can we avoid the works of the flesh? We can. The question is how? And I'm going to suggest six points that carry us through Galatians. And I'm convinced that if we will remember these on a daily basis, we can answer the question, how can I? How can I avoid the works of the flesh? Go with me to Galatians, the first chapter. Notice what it says here in verse 4. Galatians 1 and verse 4, speaking concerning the Lord Jesus Christ in verse 3, it says, who gave himself for our sins that he might deliver us from this present evil age according to the will of our God and Father. By remembering that I have been delivered. 
That's how I'm going to avoid the works of the flesh. Remember in Colossians 1 and verse 13, we've been delivered from the dominion of darkness, translated into the kingdom of God's dear Son. Let's thank God daily for that. Galatians 2 and verse 20. Again, how can I avoid the works of the flesh? By remembering this precious truth in verse 20 of chapter 2. I've been crucified with Christ. It's no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. Because I have been delivered and by remembering that I have been crucified, we sang the song a moment ago, Joe led us in that wonderful song. There is no voice that answers within. Satan might call, sin might allure us, but there's no voice that answers within. The kin hope that sin is calling for, he's dead. He's gone. He's been buried with Christ in baptism. He's been raised to walk in newness of life. Romans 6 and verse 4. Remember in 2 Corinthians 5 and verse 17. If any man be in Christ, he's a new creature. Old things pass away. Behold, all things become new. So I've been delivered from sin. Why do I want to go back and be entangled and overcoming it again? 2 Peter 2 and verse 20. I've been crucified with Christ. I'm living life anew now. Look at chapter 3 and verse 13. Christ has redeemed us from the curse of the law, having become a curse for us, for it is written, Cursed is everyone who hangs on a tree. I have been redeemed. You know the term redeemed means bought back. I've been bought with the precious blood of Christ. Paul is saying in 1 Corinthians 6 verses 19 and 20 that we've been bought with a price. Peter tells us that price is the precious, the unspotted blood of Jesus Christ, 1 Peter 1, verses 18 through verse 20. So I've been redeemed. Look at chapter 4. I need to remember this. I am now a part of a new family, a new household. Look what it says here, Galatians 4, beginning in verse 4. But when the fullness of time had come, God sent forth his son, born of a woman, born under the law, to redeem those who were under the law, that we might receive the adoption as sons. And because you are sons, God has sent forth the spirit of his son into your hearts, crying out, Abba, Father. And because you are sons, you remember the discussion going on in John 8? The Jews are saying, we have Abraham as our father. Jesus said, don't claim Abraham as your father unless you do the deeds of Abraham. He further says, oh yeah, you have a father, but your father's the devil and you do his desires. That's our family of old. We've all sinned. We've all been there. But now we have a new family. Read sometimes with earnest care Ephesians, the second chapter. Do you remember how it begins? It begins that we were dead in trespasses and sins. But about in the middle of that chapter, it says those who are afar have been brought near by the blood of Christ, for he himself is our peace. And so here's the conclusion. In verses 19 and 20, in that context, it says, so you're no longer strangers or aliens, but are fellow citizens with the saints and are of God's household. I now have a new household, a new family. Again, look at chapter 5. How can I avoid the works of the flesh? By remembering that I have been emancipated. I have been set free. I have been given, granted liberty. Look at Galatians 5 and verse 1. Stand fast, therefore, in the liberty by which Christ has made us free. And do not be entangled again with the yoke of bondage. Drop down to verse 13. For you, brethren, have been called to liberty, not only to use liberty as an, as an opportunity for the flesh, but through love serve one another. And so we have been set free. And the last point, Galatians 6 and verse 14, I now have something and someone 
to boast about. As a child of God, I have better things in Christ Jesus, my Lord. The book of Hebrews tells us that. And I have a Savior that the world has never, has never seen the likes of. And let's remember that. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. We can avoid the works of the flesh. We will when our hearts are right. And we must. Paul said, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Esther said, I will go before the king, which is not according to the law. And if I perish, I perish. Our blessed Lord said, I must be about my father's business. Yes, we can. And we will. And we must if we're serious about living the Christian life. Thank you so much for your time. <clears throat>